Hello to chapter 92 of Moby Dick by Herman Melville. And this chapter is titled Ambergris. Now, this ambergris is a very curious substance and so important as an article of commerce that in 1791 a certain Nantucket-born Captain Coffin was examined at the bar of the English House of Commons on that subject. For at that time, and indeed until a comparatively late day, the precise origin of ambergris remained, like amber itself, a problem to the learned. Though the word ambergris is but the French compound for grey amber, yet the two substances are quite distinct. For amber, though at times found on the sea coast, is also dug up in some far inland soils, whereas ambergris is never found except upon the sea. Besides, Amber is a hard, transparent, brittle, odorless substance used for mouthpieces, to pipes, for beads and ornaments. But ambergris is soft, waxy, and so highly fragrant and spicy that it is largely used in perfumery, in pastiles, precious candles, hair powders, and pomatum. The Turks use it in cooking, and also carry it to Mecca for the same purpose that frankincense is carried to St. Peter's in Rome. Some wine merchants drop a few grains into claret to flavor it. Who would think then that such fine ladies and gentlemen should regale themselves with an essence found in the inglorious bowels of a sick whale? Yet so it is. By some, ambergris is supposed to be the cause, and by others, the effect of the dyspepsia in the whale. How to cure such a dyspepsia, it were hard to say, unless by administering three or four boatloads of Brandreth's pills and then running out of harm's way, as laborers do, in blasting rocks. I have forgotten to say that there were found in this ambergris certain hard, round, bony plates, which at first stop thought might be sailors' trousers' buttons. But it afterwards turned out that they were nothing more than pieces of small squid bones embalmed in that manner. Now, that the incorruption of this most fragrant ambergris should be found in the heart of such decay is this nothing, Bethink thee of that saying of St. Paul in Corinthians about corruption and incorruption, how that we are sown in dishonor but raised in glory, and likewise call to mind that saying of Paracelsus about what it is that maketh the best musk. Also forget not the strange fact that of all things of ill savour, cologne water, in its rudimental manufacturing stages, is the worst. I should like to conclude the chapter with the above appeal, but cannot, owing to my anxiety to repel a charge often made against whalemen, and which, in the estimation of some already biased minds, might be considered as indirectly substantiated by what has been said of the Frenchman's two whales. Elsewhere in this volume the slanderous aspersion has been disproved that the vocation of whaling is throughout a slatternly untidy business. But there is another thing to rebut. They hint that all whales always smell bad. Now, how did this odious stigma originate? I opine that it is plainly traceable to the first arrival of the Greenland whaling ships in London more than two centuries ago, because those whalemen did not then, and do not now, try out their oil at sea, as the southern ships have always done, but cutting up the fresh blubber in small bits, thrust it through the bungholes of large casks, and carry it home in that manner. 
the shortness of the season in those icy seas and the sudden and violent storms to which they are exposed, forbidding any other course. The consequence is that upon breaking into the hold and unloading one of these whale cemeteries in the Greenland dock, a savor is given forth somewhat similar to that arising from excavating an old city graveyard for the foundations of a lying-in hospital. I partly surmise also that this wicked charge against whalers may be likewise imputed to the existence on the coast of Greenland in former times of a Dutch village called Schmerenberg or Smierenberg, which latter name is the one used by the learned Fogo von Slack in his great work on smells, a textbook on that subject. As its name imports, smear, fat, berg, to put up, this village was founded in order to afford a place for the blubber of the Dutch whale fleet to be tried out without being taken home to Holland for that purpose. It was a collection of furnaces, fat cattles and oil sheds, and when the works were in full operation, certainly gave forth, forth no very pleasant savour. But all this is quite different from a South Sea sperm whaler, which, in a voyage of four years, perhaps after completely filling her hold with oil, does not, perhaps, consume fifty days in the business of boiling out, and in the state that it is casked, the oil is nearly scentless. The truth is that, living or dead, if but decently treated, whales as a species are by, are by no means creatures of ill odour, nor can whalemen be recognized, as the people of the Middle Ages affected to detect a Jew in the company, by the nose. Nor, indeed, can the whale possibly be otherwise than fragrant when, as a general thing, he enjoys such high health, taking abundance of exercise always out of doors, though it is true seldom in the open air. I say that the motion of a sperm whale's flukes above water dispenses a perfume as when a musk-scented lady rustles her dress in a warm parlour. What then shall I liken the sperm whale to for fragran fragrance, considering his magnitude? Must it not be to that famous elephant with jeweled tusks and redolent with myrrh, which was led out of an Indian town to do honor to Alexander the Great. So that was chapter 92. Bye-bye. Till next time with chapter 93 titled The Castaway. <laughs>